The following is a special presentation of the Buccaneers Sports Network. This is the Jay and Keith Show. Two broadcasters. Oh, yeah. Two microphones. And one meticulously scripted podcast. You what? Just kidding. Get it, J.K.? You get it. That's what I thought was so funny. It's not funny. Alongside Keith Brake, here's the voice of the Bucks, Jay Sandoz. Oh, it is a Monday, and for those of you checking, Keith Brake did come back. I'm he back. Went to Fargo. You're not getting rid of me that easily, Jay. And it came. Not back. getting rid. Not getting rid of me that easily. Twenty-seven hours we were on the road. Twenty. A lot of night driving. On the tail end of deer mating season, where they tend to get really stupid. Yeah, that was uh, that was stressful. Only saw one, only saw, well one live one anyway. It was actually it was right in the middle of the road on I ninety four in Minnesota. It was like two hours into the trip, come around a bend. There it is in the lights, big beautiful white tailed doe, and you're like, uh oh, but. Uh, unlike my car, my fiance's car has excellent brakes, so uh, no problems there. Made it, made it through the wind and the rain. So how many and dead the Illinois deers? roads? Uh, ooh, because you said it was only live. I'm curious how many. There's only deers? one live one. Uh, there were, I don't know, man. I mean, Wisconsin. We, because we went through Eau Claire and Toma and the Dells, like the backwoods of Wisconsin, where it's like indistinguishable from northern Alabama. Like it's very, very much uh, the back country. And there was probably one every two miles at, at, on that stretch in 94. It was just. Uh, but yeah, um, it's good to be back. Still a little tired. Still a little tired, but was able to get some extra sleep and uh, we'll be able to be good to go for tonight for hoops, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Yeah, we got a lot to talk about. Obviously, bye week free tissue football, so we will go over Southern Conference uh, results because it was a Saturday where I didn't uh, have to do anything. I did watch uh, Army, unfortunately, lose to Air Force, which led to Matt McGahee's yeah. ridicule of me as he's been at Air Force for a few months and already bought into Air Force, which is hot garbage. Um and uh, then we'll talk. Uh, I watched that, and I watched uh, all of the. My kids made fun of me and said, "What are you doing?" And I was like, "Well, I had one game on the TV, one on an iPad, and one on my iPhone because mm. all three games were within an hour kick of each other." And I used to have a five TV setup in my living room, and then eventually I've gotten rid of that. And because I just, with the kids, with things, I just can't spend justify spending all the money. That I used to, uh, but, you know, it's the Saturday where it would have actually worked out. And I don't have many rare Saturdays off, but did watch all the games. And we can go into all that. Obviously, I paid a little more attention to West Carolina and Wofford, but I did watch Chattanooga Citadel, did watch Sanford VMI. And so we will talk about that uh, a little bit later on. But it is opening night for ETSU men's and women's basketball. And we'll just start with the men because we're going to have it on the Buccaneer Sports Network. The women will be on TV tonight at 8.30. Mm -hmm. They'll tip on the SEC Network. They'll take on the Finn National Champions. It, I thought it was kind of classic. Uh, Coach Mott gave me that this could be the greatest upset in the history of maybe women's college basketball because right now we're not even good enough to be a 16 seed. And they are the overall number one if you started the tournament today. So, yes, without um, question. She did say that she may not be at work for a few days if she won that. I did ask if she would <laughs> retire because I would retire. I would be like, you know what? One to know, biggest upset, women's college basketball history, I'm out. There is, you have plateaued. Good night. There's nowhere God you can go bucks. from that. There's nowhere you can go up from that. So, <laughs> that being said, we're going to talk about Coach Mock and her squad in just a second. I want to talk – uh, men's basketball, and it was a new look team. There were some familiar faces, just a couple that played from a year ago, which was Jordan King and Jaden Seymour. And then coming off the bench, uh, D'Anthony Tipler, who was with the squad last year but not able to play games. And other than that, it was a bunch of new faces. And I thought the big thing that Coach harped on they needed to do was to get post players and a post presence. And I felt like they did. If they can get – 10 points every night, 7, 8 rebounds, especially in SOCOM play from Jalen Haynes, and they get Brock Jancic with 9 and 4. Now, I'll say this. If mm -hmm. they can get a combined 20 and 10, I don't care who does what, 
But if the post position can give you 20 and 10, it's going to be a great day for ETSU on the hoops hardwood. I would agree. And I think that's the big question with this team is where does the front court production come from? Is it Taylor? Is it Haynes? Is it Janzik? Because at some point, so, I mean, early in the year, you want those guys to all kind of shoulder the workload together. At some point, though, you want one go-to guy to emerge that can play the five for you to give you a consistent interior option as your your, your first choice guy. But you know Jaden Seymour is going to get his points. Jaden Seymour is undeniable. On the wing, he is going to be an absolute handful. Jordan King is going to get points. Alan Struthers is going to create opportunities for others to score. He's been great. DeAnthony Tipler came off the bench against Limestone. I think that's probably where he starts the year, just given the fact that the three players they have uh, out there in the five between King and Struthers and Seymour all just seem to play really well together and have good chemistry. So you have Tipler off the bench who can score. Who's your interior guy? There's got to, at some point, you need a guy. And I think one of these three players, whether it's Taylor, Haynes, Jancic, one of these three is capable of being that guy. It's just a matter of getting in a groove, getting comfortable with what Dez wants him to do, and going out and executing. And to me, that will be the difference between ETSU as a pretty good SOCON team and ETSU as a SOCON title contender is how does the front court evolve over the course of the season? And I think that that's the biggest question mark because we know Jordan King can score. You knew DeAnthony Tipler, who averaged 13. Not only did he average 13 points, but he was uh, second in the Sun Belt in three-point shooting, not last year, the year before that, when last full season of playing. He was 19th nationally. And so he's going to be able to stroke – and shoot the basketball from long range. And honestly, when he is left alone, I don't know how many alone looks he's going to get, it just looks different coming off his hands. That's the one thing me and Bruce Tramberger talked about mm -hmm. on the radio broadcast of the exhibition game. No TV of that one. We should have TV tonight of the game. But when it came off his fingertips, especially if he had a clean look, it just looked different. I mean, it was like no doubters. Like just he has a nice little touch. It's a little bit of a uh, – Playground release, uh, you know, and, and Bruce can break that down better than I can. But basically, you can tell a guy that maybe doesn't have the quote unquote true mechanics, but it's also a guy that's worked on that shot so many times in the backyard at the rec center, early mornings, late night gym situations that it just you know, works and it, it works for him and it looks great. So I think it's also hard to play him and King at the same time a lot. It's mm -hmm. a very similar. To a lot of people are like, well, you know, could Tipler lead the team in scoring? I was like, well, Jordan King early in the year is going to get everybody's best player, defender, I should say, because mm -hmm. they know he's the best returning player of the all-league preseason, all that accolade stuff. And it could change later, but Tipler's probably going to have some cleaner looks, I think, early than Jordan King. ETSU was led in the 30-4 and four year by the sixth man off the bench, Trey Boyd, in scoring. Yep. And so Coach Forbes and a little bit more of the NBA mentality is – you've got to have scores on that second wave, right? That six, seven, eight, nine, ten, depending on if you play eight, you play nine, you play ten, depending on which philosophy you believe in. But generally, teams rotate eight uh, to ten, give or take. And if you have some scoring punch, then it's easier to rotate certain guys in and out. And, yes, it would be on the floor some, but there will be times where Jordan's going to be asked to be the man. Maybe DeAnthony's going to be asked to be the man on the perimeter, just like, you know, similar inside with Haynes and Janzik. But I – you know, for me, it doesn't bother me. A lot of people are like, well, if King and Tipler are your best scorers, how they're not on the floor at the same time. Well, ETSU has proven in years past that the sixth man could lead the team in scoring or be the second leading scorer and pack punch coming off the bench. And I think Tipler hasn't seemed to have shown any signs of not being a team guy where he is complaining about that. He's certainly going to get a lot of minutes. He played 24 minutes, which is, uh, was that third? Third on the team, give or take? Or mm -hmm. uh, So he's going to get minutes. He's going to get a chance to score. They gave Jordan King long spells because, honestly, you know what Jordan King's going to do. I like the way that they were uh, trying to mix and match, and I want to talk about that next because you kind of knew the starting five had been the starting five for a lot. Now, I'm pulling for one of the Jays to get in the starting lineup, whether that's Jamarius, uh, uh, or Jamarius Harrison or Justice Smith, so we have five Jays in the starting lineup just because mm -hmm. I'm a Jay and, you know, everything's better with Jay. That, that being said, um, if the Bucks continue to oh, – let me backtrack. I like the way that Coach Oliver 
after probably 15 minutes of game action, mm-hmm. he started to go to an, an experimentation mode where he had a very large lineup where he had Haynes and Janzik and Seymour, 6'8", 6'9", 6'9", at the 3, 4, 5. He also went small ball where he had King, Struthers, and Tipler all in to try to figure kind of that scenario out. And, you know, that's the time in an exhibition game. You know, close scrimmage, they probably played a little more to win Mm -hmm. versus East Carolina because they want to see good on good on some other things. They got in a situation to where they got on a nice run early. It was an exhibition game the way it was supposed to be. I know the last, like, six possessions, ETSU turned it over, and so they stayed on 71 for, like, the last four minutes of the game. And mm-hmm. Limestone made it a little closer or respectable than what it really was. But in the same token, I enjoyed that Coach Oliver used that time once ETSU got up big in the first half to kind of figure some things out. Who can play with each other? If I put guys in different positions, how do they respond? Mm -hmm. How do they run the offense, especially defensively? So I like the way Coach Oliver used that exhibition game after the first 15 minutes. And it did lead to some ugly basketball time and and probably some combinations he may not use. But in the same token, it allowed him to see how maybe the three bigs play together. How do the three little guards play together? And you're going to need that at some point this year. Every every team at every situation needs to have some sort of contingency plan. Okay, well, um, the game's really physical, and we have two bigs with two fouls early. We have to play small. How do those small guys all play together? Where you play, you have to play Seymour at the four. Granted, they played Seymour at the four last year for different reasons. And they played Seymour, I think he might have even played, he played a, five. a five. He did. He played a five. Yeah, seven. for a little bit. But that's that's a different reason. These are normal in-game scenarios that are going to happen. You want to be prepared for those things. You want to have some baseline in a live game against another team for how your group is going to fare, how they need to be coached to handle those situations, and how you need to manage your personnel and who you can trust in roles in adverse situations. Because you can have a plan, you can have an idea of what you want to do, But the moment the ball is tipped and the moment the whistles start blowing and the shots start falling or not falling, you're going to have to make adjustments. And you need to know where you can tweak and who you can put into positions to make tweaks to what you're doing over the course of the game. That's what these exhibitions are for. That's what this game against Limestone is for. Uh, This game against uh, Emery and Henry tonight. That's what it's for. Is to be a game where you get an understanding of this is how our team will work in situations where things don't go perfectly. And you're doing it in a, in a scenario or in an environment that's very low stakes. And it's better to learn that now than to learn it in the second half against Samford when, George, when Taylor picks up his fourth foul with 12 minutes left. It's better to learn that now than then. I was impressed with the press, and ETSU is going to sparingly pick its spots to press. But when Jaden Seymour guards the inbounder after a made bucket and then goes to trap immediately, that creates some havoc because he's so long, he's so athletic, plus the guards are super fast and quick. So I like how the press looked. Um, I liked how ETSU handled uh, the press. Now, that was a couple times – that uh, Limestone was able to speed ETSU up. And I think some of the guards, particularly Struthers, where, again, he sat out all last year, didn't see a lot of action or no action in game, right? So it's just different. It seemed like he was a little fast early. Then he kind of got into speed and the flow of the game, certainly athletic. He had a dunk on the break where, again, it's not just that he jumps really high because he does. It's how quick he jumps, I think, that impresses me, how quick he gets up to slam the basketball in. I think that seven guys you don't have to worry about uh, early on, at least, and they didn't show any signs. Struthers would have been my only guy. And really, well, let's say this. Josh Taylor played more minutes in in this game and the exhibition game he's ever played in his Division I life. Mm -hmm. Jalen Haynes played more in this game, 19 minutes, and he almost did his whole entire career at Virginia Tech. So there's some things there of guys getting minutes. But Taylor was one of the top, like, 75 guys in America when he got signed. So he's got ability, right? Can he fit him? Jalen Haynes is one of the top post players signed. So those guys have that there. We saw Jaden Seymour play much better at the three or maybe even an athletic four as opposed to the five last year. 
You know what you're getting out of Jordan King. You know what D'Anthony Templer's going to be. Brock Janzik played a lot in this game, or again, he didn't play a lot uh, at Tennessee. But I think those transfers, Taylor Haynes and uh, Janzik, are going to be fine because they went against really good people every single day, right? And so that helps. Struthers was sort of the out of the top seven because I'm counting Tipler in that seven, and I didn't have to worry about it. He was the one I was kind of curious to see what he could bring to the table. I think he passed the eye test for me on the exhibition game. Now the question is, who do you feel good about eight, nine, and ten? Because we know Coach Oliver would love a ten-man rotation to stay fresh. I think Christian Shaw showed a prowess to go rebound, especially on the offensive end. And then from there, I'm not real sure. You got the two D2 guys that transferred up. Jamaria Smith looked like the speed was a little better for him. I kind of heard him and Justice Smith had a rough go at it against East Carolina, the speed, physicality. D2 guys going to D1, even if they practice against it every day, I think it takes them time. Mm -hmm. But how quickly can Harrison and Smith kind of adjust, I think, could determine how the depth of this team develops over time. I'm going to go back to Struthers. I watched the scrimmage. So I, I obviously didn't get a chance. I was uh, traveling from North Dakota during the the Limestone game, but I got a chance to watch Alan Struthers during the scrimmage that they did as part of homecoming before the Sanford football game. And the first thing that stood out to me is that this guy is like, do you remember, do you remember Petey McLean? Speedy Petey. Speedy Petey, of course. Speedy Petey. Yeah, he was quick. He could get downhill, but his best attribute was as a facilitator. He was a really, really good passer of the ball, running the point for ETSU. Struthers reminds me a little bit of that, but with some more scoring upside. I think the jumper is going to come for him, but he can get to the basket and he can drive and kick. And that's something he did a lot in that exhibition. He would drive and kick and he would look for Seymour. Uh, he would look for uh, Christian Shaw. He would look for those guys on the perimeter that could maybe, you know, drive baseline and then pull up or take a shot from the corner or a wing three. Uh, he was really, really effective at getting into places that stress the defense with the basketball and then passing the ball out of those spaces into areas that are now open because of the stress he creates. And that's something that's going to get that young man on the floor a lot over the course of his redshirt freshman year. I think it's the attribute that makes him most valuable is his his driving kick ability, his passing ability. He's just someone that is going to be really electric to watch. If you're a fan of downhill basketball, uh, that's a guy that I would love to see just get behind some screens and race. You know, win a foot race to the basket because he can do it. And that's going to be the thing that, to me, gets him on the floor the most and also is going to take some of the work. You know, Jordan King is the, you know, he's got that unbelievable shooting range. He'll pull up from 30 feet if you give him the opportunity. Um, he's somebody who maybe at certain times has felt the need to do a lot with the ball in his hands. And I think Struthers can take some of that off of him where he can be more of an artillery piece if he wants to. Just kind of drift around on the arc and wait for Struthers to get in the ball, catch, shoot, drill the three. You have another option tactically to open up things for your defense by taking King off the ball because you have someone who is really reliable on it in Struthers. Even if he's not necessarily going to be the biggest threat to pull up and shoot from the perimeter himself. I think the the thing about Struthers, boy, he really is electrifying getting to the rim. He has struggled from the outside. The one concern, two concerns, I think, Jordan King's trying to play with the ball in his hands more at the point. Coach really wants him to do that because that's his best chance if he's going to get a look at to play professional basketball. Mm -hmm. And professional basketball, you're, I'm talking G League, NBA, not necessarily um, overseas. He could play two overseas. That's that's not a problem. But, you know, he wants to get some work there. Struthers, you know, coming off that redshirt freshman year, I have confidence him bringing the ball up. But, again, that's against Limestone. He showed a little bit of trouble. I think some of it was first game jitters. His first two free – he got fouled, I think, second play of the game. Missed both free throws. And, I mean, mm -hmm. he was a little juiced up. Those hit the back of the rim and come screaming <laughs> off. And so, we, me and Bruce chalked it up to – he's just so – you know, the heart rate, just everything. The adrenaline's game, flowing yes, and it's a little he, much. He, he's yeah. so happy to, to be out there. And Anthony Tipler is a talented scorer. I don't know that he's a true point guard either. The two concerns I would have is 
against a team that presses a lot, which the league now that Wes Miller's out, there's really not a lot that goes full court press mm-hmm. a lot. So I don't know how much that's going to play into it. But ball pressure – Coming across half court, man, like UNCG, Furman, some of those, I'll be curious to see. Wofford's another one. How the guards handle that pressure. The second thing that would be concerning in general is still three point shooting. Now, two talented guys that can really stroke it from the outside is, is King and Tipler. It is a little bit much because Struthers not particularly a shooter, he's a scorer. And so, him trying to uh, and I know he's in the gym, and I, I was talking to Joe Hugley about this, that he's in the gym. He's trying to work on getting more consistent from outside. Jaden Seymour believes he's a three-point shooter. He was three for 22 last year from beyond the arc. He was 0 for 2 in an exhibition game. that won't count on his stats this year. There are a few guys taking threes that somebody's going to have to hit some. Christian Shaw was a three-point shooter in high school. Again, he was 0 for 2 in this. Is that the speed of the game? Was it did the shot? You know, there's a lot to talk about. There Now, uh, Jamarius Harrison was the only other one to hit a three that wasn't Tipler and King. So three-point shooting eventually, because if it's just King and Tipler, it's going to be a long season because eventually you can take – I think you can take that away. Now, King is very uh, comfortable with midway last year, pull-up jumper, going to the rim. Struthers is obviously very comfortable, but people are going to figure out if he's only driving, right, if he mm-hmm. doesn't do anything else with the basketball. So my two concerns, because I, going into this, I would have said post-play, but I – after watching the post play game one, and again, I know it's a little bit lower competition. We'll be again today against Emory uh, and Henry, so maybe we'll we'll look to the next game to see exactly how it goes in the Asheville tournament this weekend. But those will be my two concerns. I want to watch going into tonight's contest get mm-hmm. Emory and Henry. How do the Bucks handle the ball, and then how do they shoot the three? I mean, that's a lot of basketball. Right there is how do you handle the ball? How do you shoot the three? What is your how do you shoot the three? What does your interior look like? Uh, you know, but ultimately, I think one thing you got to recognize, and and I am Team Seymour, by the way. I, I think this guy is pretty good. Uh, I think he's someone who, given his length uh, on the perimeter, when he is asked to play the three instead of the five, I think it's more of his natural position. I think it's something he can do really well. The threes might be a little streaky at times, but he's going to find ways to positively impact games for ETSU on the wing. Um, This team might not be feature complete at the beginning of the year, but I said this all the time with North Dakota State, and North Dakota State was a team that was never complete at the beginning of the year, but they played for the Summit League Championship each of the last four seasons I was there. Don't look at what they do in November. What they do in November is not going to tell you a thing about what this team is going to be in March. This is a team that has a lot of pieces that need some time to gel, which is why I, I, you know, you know me, Jay, I'm not crazy about playing non D ones. If you're a division one school in general, I think this game is really, really valuable for this team, if not necessary for this team tonight against an Emory and Henry group that's trying to, that's really kind of jumping in with both feet to moving up from Division Three to Division II. Uh, this game is really important for ETSU just to get a sense of how well they play together against live competition uh, before you really start to slide into the deep end of Division One basketball in 2022-23. This is a team that is going to have to figure out where everybody fits. We kind of know where Jordan King's going to be, right? We have an idea where we'd like to see Josh Taylor and Jalen Haynes and, and Jaden Seymour. We have an idea of what Brock Jancic can be and what DeAnthony Tipler can be. But a lot of that is, a lot of that is can. What they can be, not what they will be. And they need time to get to what uh, they will be ultimately. So this team needs to needs some time, needs some runway, if you like, to get its legs under it before it starts playing really tough competition like it will in, in non-conference and, and for that matter, well into conference play because this is going to be a really, really good year in the SoCon. I feel it. All right, so that'll be 7 o'clock tonight. Opening tip, 6.30 pregame show on the Buccaneer Sports Network, ETSU and Emory and Henry. Can we talk football, Jay? We can. Let's talk football.
right, everybody, let's talk a little Southern Conference football. I don't know where we want to start. Let's save uh, Wofford and Western to the end. Uh, let's go uh, Chattanooga Citadel and a Lim Ford was back. So, well, they're not talking a lot, but there was an injury that kept him out. He did play. I will say he didn't quite look himself. Now, I know somebody's going to yell at me and go, he had like 130 yards and 29 carries, but he he didn't look as healthy as he did against ETSU. Now, a, a limb forward 85% is probably better than most people's 100%, and I do I do accept that. 29 carries, 130 yards, two scores. Preston Hutchinson, 12 for 20, touchdown interception. Did throw an interception on the goal line, and I thought it was an excellent play uh, by the backside safety. Read the RPO and just flat out flew across the backside. You know, generally those interceptions, the backside safety fits an RPO. Mm -hmm. Tyree, Tyree uh, Robinson was very good at this. Eventually, like, hey, there's no wide receiver on the other side. Yeah. If they go to do the handoff on that side of the field, I'm just going to dart over. So he was, that was his only mistake. Chattanooga really uh, are, uh, held the Citadel in check. Citadel had a great opening drive, went right down the field and got on the board with a touchdown. It was 7 nothing, but then it was all UTC Pretty much from there, they got a field goal, a couple of four touchdowns, and a touchdown pass. It was 24-7. They didn't really look back as uh, the Citadel got a touchdown late there to make it 31-21. But for Chattanooga, a good bounce-back game. And clearly, there is a big difference when a limb forward is on the field for Chattanooga than when he's not. No doubt about it. And, you know, you don't like to think that one player is going to tip the scales for you that much. And certainly, I mean, you really hope that your run game is not dependent on the running back, that it's dependent upon the ability of your offensive line and your tight ends to execute your scheme. But it certainly feels like there are teams at this line, ETSU's one of them this year, where there is a significant difference in your first option back and your second option back. And that's not a slight to Appleberry or Irby, but those guys just aren't at that level yet that Ford and Sailors have been at. And when those guys come out of the game, your run game does drop off. And having those guys, even if they're banged up, and they are banged up at this point of the year, running back takes more hits than any other position on the field. Those teams run the football a lot. They utilize those players a lot. I have no doubt that a limb forward is sore every time he gets out of bed in the morning. I mean, I, I'm sore because I had to sit in an overpack Nissan Versa like, my knees hurt when it, when I stand up and sit down. I've got bruises on my kneecaps. I can even, look, I mean, look at look at this. Look at this. It's it's purple. Look at that. That's probably what a limb forward feels like right now from taking all of those hits. Getting so banged up and beat up and putting so much stress on your body. But he is still just that good with his vision, his explosion. I That's somebody that Chattanooga is going to need over the last two weeks of their schedule because, man, I tell you, they got they got a big one coming up this week, and they need him 100%. They need, or they need him 90% if they can get him at 90% to take on a really formidable Sanford team that has been better this year at stopping the run. I'm really glad you wear pants a lot, by the way. I just want to, after you... Hiked your pant leg up there. That's yeah, funny. no, you, uh, you, 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 well, I mean, we're indoors, so it's not like the sun can reflect off my legs and blind people. Yeah, that was, uh, that was an interesting look. All right. Uh, <laughs> for VMI, uh, they got good news. Seth Morgan was back. They were much more competitive. Actually led 9 nothing almost through the entire second quarter. Then Sanford kind of got things going, but Corey Britty, 33 carries, 113 yards. Seth Morgan, 213 in the air. He did have two picks, though. And, again, that Sanford defense continues to make plays. And then once Sanford kind of got going, it was just touchdown, touchdown, touchdown. I mean, it just kind of rattled it off. They got their first touchdown uh, with 525 to go. And, again, the fourth field goal by Jerry Rice was 12-7 halftime. Mm -hmm. And I kept getting messages from some of my SoCon fans like, hey, you know, what's going on here at Sanford? And I'm like, well, VMI has been able to ball control. Seth Morgan clearly is – you know, a guy that's seen a lot of game action was able to control it. I think VMI was able to found, uh, find a lot of success on the ground. I think that kind of helped too. But then start third quarter uh, after the opening kickoff, three plays, 61 yards, including a 49-yard touchdown pass from Michael Hires. Then the next drive, a two-play, 75-yard, including a 70-yard touchdown. Kendall Watson, a 
caught from Michael Hires. And then it was that Chandler Smith guy again, 14 plays, 90 yards, almost five minutes huh. off the clock. And it was 27-15. And just for good measure, with three minutes to go, they tacked on another one. So Sanford got things a little slow. Other than ETSU, they literally have had a hard time starting the game mm -hmm. off. Uh, now, I was paying a lot more attention to the other games than this one, even though it was up and I was watching it. I didn't pay attention. I need to go back and watch it. Did Sanford go warp speed from the start of the game? And so far, the only time they've done that on every single play was ETSU. So I'll be curious to see if they were warp speed to start or if they went warp speed in the second half or see if they even went warp speed at all. Either way, Sanford did what they're supposed to do. They got two games left. It's Chattanooga. It's Mercer to round out. And they pretty simple, right? They are the only undefeated team. They stay undefeated. They win the conference. Most likely, I believe, would get a seed, uh, considering that they had all FCS um, – I didn't have any non-qualifiers. Their only loss at that point right. would be to the number uh, one team in the AP polls and probably after, I don't even know if the new college football playoff standings yeah, came out. Yeah, they, they lost to the literal best college football team in America. Like, not even qualified as like, was like South Dakota State. It's like, oh, they're the best football team in the country. NFCS. Georgia is, the, Georgia is one of those teams, especially this year, that's like, could they beat the worst team in the NFL? The answer is obviously no. But you yes, never help but wonder, right? Like they're just that good, and they're that much better than everybody else. And Samford went in there, and I believe, um, I believe, held them to fewer points than uh, UT did. Is that correct? Thirty-three, right? Thirty-three for Georgia. Yes, they scored more than thirty-three. So, so yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's, that I think that's one that you can hand wave away at this point if you're Sanford. They've kept their noses clean. It hasn't always been pretty. It's an, it hasn't always been perfect, but they have found ways to win all their football games. A lot. It was 27. Oh, it was 27. A lot. Oh. I like to do that for a lot. whatever reason. I thought it was a lot. It more sounded than great to me. I mean, let's let's just give give credit there. Listen, listen. As a as a, a noted Vols hater, it brings me no joy to say that UT is both good and fun this year. I get that, but uh, no Samford going into the hedges and coming out only giving up thirty three. You feel pretty all right about that, and and the Bulldogs now in a position where for me, I, I definitely think they're in the mix for that. That's six, seven, eight. You know, SDSU and NDSU from the Valley, and then Sac State, Montana State, Weber State. I feel like in some combination are your top five. After that, Holy Cross, Samford, Idaho, Incarnate Word, Bill and Mary might sneak in there. Chattanooga, I think, is still in there. And if they beat Samford, they're back in that mix. Those are the teams that are fighting for seeds on the back end of the top eight. Uh, and Samford is... If they win this game this week, they still got Mercer next week, but you feel like they're in a position where they really have the opportunity to earn for themselves a seed in the FCS playoffs in that all-important, all-precious, highly sought-after first-round bye. So here's a, a question that somebody posed to me um, right now. Mm -hmm. Who is going to be the player of the year in the Southern Conference. Ooh. And the only thing I – I mean, it, Alim Ford missed a game and they lost. And he's got two more to go. I think that certainly should hold weight if they win the rest of the year. And then the only time they didn't have like 200 yards rushing as a team was – or 150 or whatever it was, is the only game that he didn't get a play. And I think that should hold some weight. But you look at – Michael Hires, he is 249 He's really for good. 326, 76% percent completion percentage for the season. Just three interceptions to 27 touchdowns, 2,483 yards. So he's averaging, you know, like 280 yards a game. <laughs> quick math. I'm not very good at math, but quick math. Uh, so, I, you know, and then you look at Jacob Sailors. I mean, leading the league in all-purpose yards, leading the league in rushing yards, leading the league in yards per game. You got a lot of that, but he's on a team that's not particularly good uh, as far as the standings go. And so, generally speaking, it's tough for you to be player of the year for your team. And it's not supposed to work that way, but that's how it works, right? So, 
if I was to handicap it, I would say Hires right now is a leader in the clubhouse. I would put a Lim Ford second because his team is better and Jacob Saylor's third, even though I'm probably biased and would vote Jacob Saylor second. I don't know. What do you got? I know I, I threw I, that at you with no research. I have always, I have always maintained that, that you hate Sanford quarterbacks. That the most impactful players in Sanford's offense are the wide receivers because what is the air yards per attempt for the quarterback? You still got to make good decisions, right? The ball still got to come out on time. But who makes those plays, really? It, does the quarterback make the plays in that offense? Or is it the receivers who are excelling in that offense who are making it go? If your receivers fall down at the end of every hitch and every quick slant or they don't have good vision and they allow themselves to get funneled into tackles that limit the yak yards of that play, then your offense isn't nearly as effective. I am a I am really impressed by the way that Chandler Smith and, and Kendall Watson as well um, have been able to make a real lasting impact on this offense. And for me, I mean, you look at the Tennessee Tech game and you go back to the very beginning of the year, second game of the year, and the first game probably as well, but the second game against Tennessee Tech, a game that has the potential in that moment to be a rake. Remember that scene in The Simpsons where Sideshow Bob is surrounded by rakes and he steps on one, he turns around and he steps on another one, they both hit him in the face, he turns around, he steps on another one, they zoom out, he's surrounded by them for like 20 feet out. That's what Tennessee Tech could have been for Sanford. They do not win that game without Chandler Smith. They just don't. To me, that's someone that should get a look even before someone like And the numbers are impressive. The numbers are impressive for hires, but he's throwing the ball, what? Five yards, six yards. It's not like he's going 15 yards down the field, hitting post routes and, you know, throwing the deep ball on the on the go routes down the, down the sidelines, you know, chucking it out there and dropping it in the bucket. He's hitting these receivers in stride and they are making the, they're doing the heavy lifting. So I'm a big fan of, of what Chandler Smith and Kendall Watson have done. I think you can make a case probably for Smith ahead of Watson, but I, I would I would not be unwilling to hear someone lay out the case for Kendall Watson. I, I think there's a case to be made for Devron Harper at Mercer. And and I think a lot of it depends on what happens over the last two weeks of the season. Um, whether it's Ford, Harper, Hires, somebody else. A lot of that's going to be determined by some really big matchups the last couple of weeks. We're going to see, you know, Michael Hires and Alim Ford in the same game on Saturday. And, of course, we're going to see Chandler Smith and Kendall Watson in that game as well. We're going to get to see um, Devron Harper against that Sanford group as well. You're going to get the opportunity to compare them in the same time span of three hours in the same location. I think you have a lot still to be decided. And I don't think there is anybody who is locked into Southern Conference Player of the Year as we sit here today with two games left in the season. All right, so 27 touchdown passes for hires. Devron Harper has 16 touchdowns on the season. Jacob Sailors has 15 touchdowns on the season. Your third leading scorer, Tyler Keltner, in all of the Southern Conference. <laughs> And I love Tyler, but no kicker's ever going to win this thing. No. Uh, he's there got, is a, a, he's got a chance to be an All-American, but there's no chance he's going to win this There thing. is a special teams player of the year, though, right? The, yes, there is. Yeah, Keltner's going to win that going away. Yeah. Has to. Has a, to. A Lim Ford has 12 touchdowns uh, as far as that goes. Then you go a couple of kickers, and Ty James and Chandler Smith, each with 10 touchdowns. I mean, Fred Payton's numbers aren't particularly awful either, but if you were to pick somebody – from Mercer, I would have to imagine Harper would be your pick. Uh, just guessing. I mean, you look at Peyton, who has thrown an absurd amount of interceptions in a short period of time because he went from zero to seven uh, pretty quickly. But he does have 28 touchdown passes. His completion percentage is 68%. He's thrown 2,200 yards. Um, 
But, again, he throws a lot of short ones, too, and let guys kind of catch and go. The only real quarterback that just presses every ball down the field is Western Carolina, no, no matter which one it is, Davis or Gonzalez. They, they are chunking that thing down the field mm -hmm. on almost every mm -hmm. single play. Mm -hmm. You know, Sanford picks his poison, right? They throw a lot of short, a lot of short. Then they hit one over the top, or occasionally they get a, a you know, a 10-yard end cut, and then the speedy receiver just outruns everybody. You see a few of those here and there. So, anyways, that was an interesting conversation as far as – and I got sidetracked, so we got to do one more game recap on kind of the thought process on who would be that. And I think there's four players, I think. Harper, Ford, Sailors, Hires. I think those are the four that are probably going to be up for. Sure. And, and I'm not saying Peyton might be the fifth, uh, but to me, if you're going to take somebody from Mercer, I think it's got to be Harper because he scored on a kick. He's scored receiving. He scored rushing. They do everything they can to get him the football. He's maybe the most versatile player. Uh, and, again, I, I'm not trying to offend Jacob Sailors' own guy, but he's probably the most versatile player in the league as far as he's creativity. He's unquestionably the most versatile player yeah, in the league. Yeah, so that being said, The right. only real analog to Sailors is Harper, and Harper is a wide receiver. Sailors is a running back. They technically are he's a halfback. They technically play different positions. Um, but those are the two players that you can think of. Like, the only real comparable for Sailors and everything he's done for ETSU is what Harper has done for Mercer. Let's look at Western Carolina and Wofford. It was an entertaining game. West Carolina got an opening field goal. Then it was a Ryan Ingram, a touchdown. Then West Carolina took a 12-7 lead. And then I thought a huge play for Wofford. They got the ball with a minute and seven to go right before half. And they ran a little draw. And it's the usual. Like, if you get a big play, right, you try to go score. Yep. Got a 13-yard play on a draw. Then they hit Kyle Penix for a couple big passes. Then they get a touchdown pass to Kyle. It's like the Kyle Penix drive after the initial run. So they go to the locker room. Wofford does 14-12. Then they double up. Take the kickoff, go down. They score again. It's 21-12. And then all of a sudden, the West Carolina offense kind of woke up. Big play after big play. Sincere Lee caught a touchdown pass. Then a 73-yarder to Raphael Williams, who, again, I think – between him and Harper, I would love to see just a pure foot race. Just <laughs> you line up at the goal line, 100 yard sprint, boys. Go see who wins because those are two of the fastest dudes on the planet. I'm just convinced. So, and then, uh, you know, so it's 21 or 26 21 at that point. Wofford scores. They get the two point. It's 29 26. McCollum kicks the field goal, seven minutes to go. We're all tied up, similar to ETSU, almost the same exact scenario. Seven minutes to go, tie game. Wofford gets the ball, doesn't score. Western Carolina gets the ball. They do go down. They score five plays, 40 yards, um, and then that's the ball game. But it was a similar situation to ETSU and Wofford, so I think it's going to be fairly the same type drive. Um, all right, same not stop drive. Sorry, same type game. Uh, the big thing was it wasn't a turnover that got the ball in the plus side of the field. It was a very rare bad punt by Landon Parker. Had a 26-yard punt, and then that led to the short field. So ETSU turned it over against Wofford. Wofford yeah. able to score. This was a bad punt, but both teams lost the game because the other team started in the plus territory. And then Wofford had more time to try to make a comeback with a couple minutes, 2.30, give or take. But that being said, it was an entertaining game. Um, Wofford continues to show better offense prowess and understanding and getting guys open, and they're starting to grow under that system. Be curious to see what they do with that head coaching position. Mm -hmm. My guess is they're probably going to bring somebody else in. That would be my guess as well. Just a guess. I wouldn't hate it if they stuck – with Watson, but I get it if they feel like they need to do something else there. But they're clearly playing for him. They're playing hard. They were right there. West Carolina snaps like a five-game losing streak. I didn't realize they had been on a five-game losing streak, but they continue to show they can press the ball down the field. It was one of the more – in the beginning of the year, if I said Wofford Western, you'd probably vomit in your mouth a little bit uh, <laughs> having to watch the game. But it turned out to be, I thought, an outstanding game. Um Western drove the ball more, at least picked up a few first downs here and there, and then kind of sputtered out right around midfield several times. But they had over 500 yards of offense. Wofford 349 yards. But entertaining game, which led to West Carolina win. West Carolina now breaks the five-game skid. 
they come into Johnson City Saturday, which we'll talk about a little bit later in the Blue Ridge uh, Battle Border as we get further in the week. Blue Ridge Border Battle. I do love that. It's a rock. Blue Ridge Border Battle. It's got a got a big rock. They went up to the mountain and found a rock. Absolutely. I didn't paint it and put a thing. Yeah, it's college. That's what it is. Time to win the rock. Let's go win the rock, boys. Let's St- go. Standings, uh, <laughs> not much change. Sanford 6-0. and Furman, Mercer, Chat, all 5-1. and Western and Wofford, 2-4. and The Citadel, 2-5. and ETSU, 1-6. and And VMI, 0-6. Oh, and six. Last conference game of the year for ETSU. Everybody else has two conference games left. So ETSU at least trying to pick up a uh, second win and try to Climb out of where they are in the standings. Uh, West Carolina Wofford each begin of the year two wins. Didn't I, I saw Western having more? Mm-hmm. I saw Wofford having none. So clearly I've nailed that. So, well, when Wofford made the change, they started yes. playing. Yes, and if I if I would have known that, I would have predicted. And then the second they made the change, uh, I predicted some wins, mm-hmm. uh, and so they did. Uh, and As, yeah. competing, and I, they have been competing. I want to go outside the SoCon for a second. At what point do we make the case for uh, Sacramento State as the number one team in the country? When do you want to make that case? When do you want to start making that case? Undefeated. Uh, they just beat Weaver State. They have beaten in the Massey ratings in consecutive weeks. Consecutive weeks. They have beaten the number seven, nine, and three teams in the Massey ratings. They also have an FBS win. They boat race Colorado State. Not that says a whole lot, but this is a group that has played the... Um, Fifth toughest schedule to date, according to Massey. They have the number one offense, number seven defense, and they have not lost against that schedule. I feel like there's a case to be made for them to be number one over South Dakota State. Even though South Dakota State won a really tough game against survived. Northern Iowa. Yeah, survived that one, I thought. Yeah, they had to... Um, I mean, that's that's what Northern Iowa does every year, right? They start out really rough. And then they wake up in the second half of the year and they get better. And then uh, it's too little too late this season for Mark Farley and company. I'm not sure that group's going to make the playoffs uh, at all. But um, I think there's an argument to be made. It's either South Dakota State or Sacramento State. And you'll remember, a couple years ago, Troy Taylor came in there, turned things around immediately, got them a seed for the first time ever. Austin P went out there and beat the brakes off of them. Were, they were way more ready to play. Sac State was ready to be done for the year. They packed it in. That has been the knock on Sacramento State is what do they do in big games? Well, I mean, this year, you can't say that. Montana comes in on national linear television and you beat them. Idaho comes in, a team with a lot of good energy, a lot of good vibes, hadn't had an FCS loss yet. And you beat them. Weber State, you go to their place where they are notoriously difficult to beat. And you beat them. And now you got Portland State, which should be a fairly straightforward game. And UC Davis in the Causeway Classic. We'll see how that goes at the end. But right now, I don't think it's cut and dried that South Dakota State is number one. And I don't think we should take it for granted just because they beat the Bison at their place this year. I think if you're Sacramento State, I don't think you care if you're one or two. I think what you're really pulling for is North Dakota State to be on the same side of the bracket as South Dakota State. Oh man, could that is what I think Sacramento? Oh. If you if you put some true serum out there, I think if you yeah. said, "Hey, you have a choice. You can be number one, or you can guarantee that South Dakota State and North Dakota State are on the same side of the bracket, opposite of you." I think they take that over the number one seed any day of the week. Uh, probably. I Probably. think that would that would be now. Ultimately, nobody knows that until you seed and uh, you know and, and get into there. And, and once the committee gets in the room, and we've been shocked. Usually, we're not shocked on the top six seeds. Maybe even seven. You're not shocked. You may be shocked on if somebody was three or four or something mm-hmm. like that. But you're not shocked in who is the top seven getting the seed. Right. Eight eight has been a little more in flux the last few years. But I think South or Sacramento State, I think their big thing is if they could just let those two rival rivals go at it one more time, at each other, expend that energy, let's say in a semifinal game before they would go to Sac State. Now, mm-hmm. obviously, Sac State would love the number one because you play at home, and, and I don't discount that. But number two seed is still home field all the way to Frisco. All the way to Frisco. So 
I think if you if they meet in the semifinal, you got a fi- uh, semifinal at your place, and those two are battling each other on the other side of the bracket. I don't I don't think you care. I think if Sacramento State's a one, and North Dakota State's the four, and they got to play them, I think that that adds some issues. I think if they're two and North Dakota State is three, that adds issues. I think if you're Sacramento State, because of the Frisco element, you don't really care if you're one or two. You're still going to be home field all the way. You just want to be on the opposite side of North Dakota State and make them battle South Dakota State. I think that would be what they should be pulling for, but there's no way to really guarantee that because even if they're the one, you can make a case for North Dakota State to be a four right now. If they're the two – you can make a case North Dakota State could possibly be a three. Mm-hmm. What Absolutely. you don't want is North Dakota State and South Dakota State's one, two. No. Then then Sacramento State's got a lot to complain about, I think, because then you're just giving North Dakota State – and I'm not arguing because of how many times they have won, you shouldn't get some consideration. But I don't know if this is truly a new year, Then and it is on what you've done this year – then I don't think you can look at everything that you have to look at right now and say North Dakota State is a two. Agreed. And I think me and you are in that boat. I think 85% of America is in that boat. I would be curious to see if a committee, do they give that much respect to North Dakota State that they would jump something like that? I could see them... Maybe sneaking into like the three. If they run the table, that's where I and think they beat because their, their they last two games are Southern Illinois and North Dakota, which are bubble teams. You win those two games, maybe you win one of them convincingly, and you feel pretty all right about where you are at the end of the process. But um, I think it's it's really tough to get over Sac State or South Dakota State without major shuffling at the top of the seeding picture in the last two weeks of the season. So I think what we'll do um, Wednesday, we're going to talk women's basketball because we ran out of time today. We're going to talk women's basketball for sure. We'll recap men's basketball uh, a little bit. We will talk, I think, playoffs. I think we'll, we'll go in sort of a deep dive again on the playoffs. We'll also talk ETSU volleyball. Congratulations to David Jenkins. Her team uh, did win the regular season championship. So we'll talk ETSU on the men's side basketball, women's side basketball, volleyball, and we'll talk playoffs. Yeah, I think playoffs. That's playoffs. It. And I think that's where we need to go on Wednesday. We'll probably get in just a little bit of a longer show, but Monday with uh, having to go reset up over Freedom Hall, uh, we got to you know, actually do our day job at some point. So, or our night job. Night job. I mean, podcast. We'll be back uh, Wednesday, and we'll be back Thursday. Thursday, we'll have the deep dive football, ETSU Western Carolina, and we'll preview uh, the tournament over in Ashland. Okay, Jane Key Show. Okay. Oh, you gotta be kidding me!